In this video, I'm going to be testing three different stoneware clay bodies, from thrown and trimmed to glazed and finally reduction fired. I want to try and find an alternative stoneware body which I can coat with the same glaze as I'm using and achieve notably different surface qualities. This way, it's the clay body that's changing the end result and not the glazes used. All three are clays from Spencroft, and this first body is called Fleck. It's said to be packed with iron that should bleed through at high temperatures, especially when fired in reduction, like I do. Next is SSB 8G. It's a slightly grogged clay that's supposed to be excellent at resisting warping and cracking, so says their website, which I'd like to test as my usual ES80 stoneware clay body does have a slight tendency to warp and thrown and trimmed very thinly and fired to a high temperature. Strangely enough, this body looks like it's more flecked than the last, but we'll see. I will be showing you the end results and what these clay bodies do to the final glazes at the end of this video. And lastly, there's SP1, which is the same as the previous body, but without the grog, meaning it probably won't be quite as strong, but I really doubt I'll actually notice that. Annoyingly, for the purpose of this video, all three are a very similar colour, so it won't be quite so easy to track them through the making process until we see the finished fired pieces. As a reference, this is the stoneware I normally use, which is an entirely different colour, likely as it's stained with red iron oxide. And so, to test these clays, instead of making test tiles, with each of these new clays, I'll be throwing three of these small bowls. This way I'll get to experience what it's actually like to work with them too, and these bowls are very easy to glaze thickly, so they should demonstrate any changes nicely. Each of these is thrown from half a pound of clay, which is 226 grams. They're weighed out, and then I quickly wedge each lump, just enough to bring all the weighed out pieces together. The other bonus with making these is that they're very quick to throw, each one only taking a minute or so. The softer the clay, the better for these, to a point of course. I want the centering to only take a moment, and then I push my finger and thumb into the middle to create a slight hollow, and then immediately I begin to pull the walls up and outward. All three of these clay bodies threw more or less the same, so I won't be showing this process for each. They did feel noticeably smoother than the clay body I normally use, but otherwise there was no real difference between this and the body I normally throw with. Once the height and width is more or less where I want it, I sponge out any excess water, and as this was the first bowl of the batch, and I hadn't yet set my throwing gauge, I measure the pot with a ruler to make sure it's accurate, and then I set the point of my throwing gauge's pointer so it comes to a stop just beside the rim of the bowl. And once set, I tighten the arm so it won't move if accidentally hit. And now, when I throw the rest of the bowls after this, I'll have a physical point to aim for in space, as I'm pulling up the walls and shaping the pot. The next step is to scrape clean the inside surface so it has a lovely continuous curve to it. I then scrape away a portion of the excess clay underneath, creating an area that's slightly drier and from which I'll be able to easily lift the pot away. Like so. The next lump of clay is slammed down on the skim of clay left over from the last. It's slightly tacky and not wet and helps this next piece of clay stick down to the wheel very firmly. The clay is quickly coned up and down if I feel it needs it, which this lump did as something about it just felt slightly uneven. I then flip down the throwing gauge's point and then open up the lump of clay, leaving about a centimetre or so in the base of the pot. That way I'll have ample material to trim later on to create a tall foot ring, which is a feature most of my bowls have. If I feel like the rim is getting slightly unorderly, I'll compress it, like so, before beginning my next pull. There probably is too much water in these, and that might be a problem if these pots took me a long time to throw, as the excess water sitting inside the pot will degrade its strength. But as it's only in there for a few moments, as I splash these pots in water in order to throw them very quickly, then it doesn't really matter. The water gets removed, and then all the slip is scraped away, and a nice clean surface is left. And I use the profile of this metal kidney to push into the bowl to ensure the shape is good. The chamois leather is then draped over the rim to soften it, a wire drawn through underneath 
and the bowl plucked away and placed on the wareboard to my right. Here's all nine of them, and they do vary very slightly in tone, but other than that, there's no real way of telling them apart, hence the pieces of paper that follow these pots around, and I pray I don't mix them up. I'll leave these pots out overnight in order to dry to a consistency called leather hard. Whereas before, I couldn't handle the pots otherwise they would just deform as I touched them, I can now pick them up and move them around, but the clay is still very malleable and easy to damage, so I'm very careful not to handle them too roughly. Sometimes, before the trimming really begins, if I notice the interior curve isn't quite right, I'll quickly tap centre the bowl the right way up and then scrape over the surface with the same kidney used before. The bowl is then placed upside down on its rim and gently tap centred once again so the bowl is spinning right in the middle of the wheel. I then press three lumps of soft clay around the rim to secure it in place as I turn its foot. I then measure the bottom so I know how wide my foot needs to be. These are four and a half centimetres across. And then I begin trimming the excess clay on the outside and forming the foot. And whilst none of these clay bodies felt that much different to throw with, they certainly felt different to trim. The clay felt very smooth, but unlike porcelain does, and the turnings themselves really seemed to stay together and create very long strands. And the surface left was much smoother compared to the usual clay body I use, which, when trimmed, can leave quite an open body, with lots of tiny holes and scratches in the surface. Whereas all three of these, once trimmed, had very smooth, quite sealed surfaces. And whilst that didn't make much of a difference now, apart from it being quite a different tactile experience, it's when they were glazed that it made the biggest difference. And you'll see that later in this video. With the outer form trimmed, I then hollow out the footwell. Just removing a little bit of clay at first has to create clear boundaries of where to trim to when I begin removing more clay at once. To gouge away material like this, I hold the turning tool extraordinarily firmly. And really, as I move the tool from the center to the side, I'm slicing through the clay as opposed to tearing through it. As the footwell gets deeper, I check the thickness of the base by just pushing on it lightly with my thumb. And if it gives even just the slightest bit, I know it's time to stop trimming, as I certainly don't want to make a hole in the bottom of this. I then stamp the bowl with my maker's mark, and then, so I could identify these tests, I pricked them with either one, two, or three tiny holes. Ultimately, I want to have three bowls of each, nine in total, with each trio being glazed with my white, pale green, and dark green crackle glaze. One dot is the Fleck clay body, two dots is the SS BHG, and three dots is the SP1. With all the bowls trimmed, I'll now let them dry for a couple of days until they're bone dry and all the moisture has left them. All of my work is then bisque fired. This is the process of heating the pots up to 1000 degrees Celsius which I do in my electric kiln that I can program to fire automatically overnight. Three stacks of three test clays surrounded by my usual ES80 stoneware clay body, which is remarkably pink at this stage. This process of firing them to a thousand degrees makes the pots much stronger as they vitrify slightly and the clay body also becomes porous, which means that when they're dipped into a bucket of glaze, the water all the raw materials are suspended in is absorbed into the clay body, leaving a layer of those raw materials on the outside surface of the pot. The kiln is then closed and for this firing the pots can touch as the clay won't get hot enough to fuse. The power is turned on and the program set. And now I can let this fire overnight by itself. And it was a pleasure to receive this copy of Ceramic Review that same afternoon, which includes a masterclass I did. They shot a YouTube video too, and I'll leave a link to that video down in the description below. It's a bit surreal really. It's a magazine I've been reading since I was 15 years old, when I was first learning to make pots. So it's a bit unbelievable to finally have a feature like this. Anyway, back to the bowls. Two days later, after the kiln has fired and cooled down, it can be opened up and all the pots removed. I thought each of these three clay bodies might change into a slightly different color at this stage, but once again, they're all the same. At least the pots have their dots on now, so making a mistake should be quite difficult. You can hear the difference in the material. 
and if I were to try picking up unfired bone tripods by the rim, they would definitely break. And so the next step, which is quick, is waxing the feet of these. That way I create an area that masks any glaze that would otherwise adhere to it, which is important as I can't glaze the base of a pot and fire it directly on the kiln shelf, as otherwise all the glaze would melt and it would stick the pot firmly to the kiln shelf, resulting in the bowl being destroyed and potentially damaging the shelf itself. This is something I do to the bottom of every single pot I make. And I always dab just a tiny bit of extra wax over my maker's mark to make sure it's properly sealed. All of the bowls were then dipped in glaze, they're held beneath the surface for a few seconds, then once taken out, I move them around in such a way that the glaze swirls around the interior form, settling in a nice even layer as it quickly dries. And I immediately noticed the difference with these bowls. As the clay itself was more sealed and smooth, the glazed surfaces once these pots had dried were far neater compared to those I usually make, and the curves of the pot themselves barely needed any tidying up, save for where the tongs had grasped them, and the foot of course. This tidying up happens a few days later, once all that water that was absorbed into the porous clay body has evaporated. I then carefully fettle all the way around the pot to make sure the glaze is as even as possible and then most importantly I thoroughly clean the foot of each, making sure there's absolutely no glaze on them. Even with the wax there, glaze can still settle in droplets on it, so it's those really I'm taking care of, together with making sure that the line where glaze and clay meet is as clean and precise as it can possibly be. I work over a basin of water, that way all the glaze dust that's removed simply falls into it and later I can recycle that back into my larger buckets of glaze, so really very little is wasted, unless of course the pot misfires and has to be destroyed, but that doesn't happen very often. And please excuse the wound on my hand for many of these clips, it's a stupid cut caused by the rim of a bucket bucking backwards as I finish pouring glaze. Typically I just use my fingertips for this process, but if there are bigger drips on the inside or on the outside walls, I'll use either a curved kidney to scrape clean the innards and the knife's edge to remove the drips on the outside. But like I said, these bowls barely needed anything, which made tidying them up a simple pleasure. With enough pots glazed, it's time to start packing the kiln, and with this pack, I tried to distribute the bowls evenly from top to bottom, hiding some deep within the crevices beneath bowls and raising others up into the space above them. The kiln shelves can be quite tricky to load on such tight layers, so I make sure my hands are positioned in such a place that when it comes to release them, they can do so without colliding with the rim of a pot. And unlike the bisque firing, in this gas reduction firing, the pots can absolutely not touch, as the molten glaze on both vessels will fuse together. At the same time, I try to pack the kiln as densely as possible, as doing so will make achieving a strong, heavy reduction easier, as there's simply less physical space for the oxygen to be. And with the kiln fully packed and the clay tests tucked neatly away inside, I can head home early, ready to light the kiln at 7am the following morning. each of the four burners is lit and put on its minimal setting, and I'll heat the kiln up very slowly for the first few hours, as rushing the early stages, if there is still any moisture left in any of the pots, could potentially cause them to explode. The door is sealed tight, the bungs are placed in the spy holes, and I very gradually increase the temperature, with not much changing until about 530 degrees. At that temperature, I switch on the air compressor, which helps feed the flames, together with introducing a horrible noise that goes off every couple of minutes, especially towards the end of the firing when I'm using more air. I take notes every 30 minutes, jotting down the time, the hour, the temperature, the gas pressure, the air pressure, and the dampers, which cover the flues on the back of the kiln. These are adjustable, and at 860 degrees, I slide the dampers halfway over the flues to initiate reduction. This means the exhaust can't escape as quickly as it would like, and as there's too much fuel in the chamber, all trying to ignite at the same time, there isn't enough oxygen for this process to happen efficiently, so the fuel, instead of finding oxygen in the atmosphere itself, begins to take it from the clay and glazes of the pots, thus giving you colours which you can't quite achieve with an electric kiln in the same way. 
Every now and then, especially towards the end of the firing, I peek through the spy holes in the door of the kiln to look at the pyrometric cones that are packed alongside the pots, and once they've all bent over to my liking, I can switch the kiln off, open the dampers and the spy holes, and crash cool the kiln down by about 150 degrees. This helps to retain colour and gloss, and this is what the pyrometric cones look like through the hole. You can just about make out the arch of cone 10's back. Once the kiln has been crash cooled sufficiently, I completely seal it up, causing the metal to contract. And from this point, I'll let the kiln cool down very slowly over about 36 hours. What are you doing up there? A few days later, and with the temperature hovering at about 180, I slightly open the damper and then unseal the door. Somewhere inside here are my clay tests. It was a very successful firing with practically no seconds or ruined pots whatsoever. Let's get all the bolts out and then have a real look at what the differences are. These pieces on the top are still scalding hot to the touch, hence the heat resistant gloves I wore for unpacking many of the top layers, as they remain hot for much longer than the lowest. Initially, it's quite difficult to make out much of a difference. They look similar to how my glazes usually do, but they're perhaps a bit murkier and it looks like there are more impurities scattered across the surface. Before I have a real look at them though, I quickly sand the exposed clay on the base of each of them. And now I can have a proper look. On the top, and quite obviously so, is Fleck. Below that is SS, B8, G, and at the bottom is SP1. Now they all look more or less the same in terms of tonality, but up close there are some subtle differences. If we compare the white between SP1 and SSB, 8 G, You'll see that SP1 is just a bit more grey around the edge, and it doesn't break to the warmer colour I normally prefer. I think Fleck was the real winner. The colours themselves are a bit more murky than my usual glazes, but I like the iron speckling, although it borders that point of just being a bit too much. Let me know what you think. I love how you can see the metal on the clay body itself, as these tiny molten dots. And here it is compared to my usual clay body, which is far more uniform both the clay body itself and the glaze surrounding it. Whereas SP1 and SSB 8G are so similar that it's quite difficult comparing the two. The interesting thing about SP1, which contain less grog than the other two, is that the form on the insides of all three of these bowls has slumped ever so slightly, which means that the curve doesn't feel as perfect as the other two clay tests, meaning it probably can't quite handle being fired to the temperature I go to, which makes sense as on Spencroft's website, it says the upper limit for this clay is 1280 degrees. So the other one will have to do, and I like it for a body that has just a bit more character compared to my usual. And whilst you may say this looks a lot like the one I normally use, here are the three new clays with my old one above it, which just looks so plain now in comparison. Anyhow, let me know what you think of these clay tests. I will be making a much more thorough video like this, with a whole variety of new clays I've been sent by pot clays, which I'm sure will have even more dramatic effects. But for now, I think I'll be ordering some Fleck and some SSB 8G to introduce a subtle variety in surface texture if I want it. I had hoped the results would be a bit more dramatic, but what can you do? It's always exciting doing material tests like this, even if the results don't come out quite like you imagined. Thank you so much for watching, and if you have any clay type suggestions for me, please let me know. I'm always on the lookout for interesting high iron bodies that fire to about cone 10, as that seems to be what works best with my glazers. And like always, I'll see you next week.